Naveen, you're working in Cairo Dero. Can you tell me about what it's been like since the floods came? What work do you do? And can you explain where Cairo Dero is and what the situation is there right now? So we work in, worked in about 200 villages in districts Larkana, um, Kambar Shadad Court and Shikarpur. And our community center and public Pukar office are based out of village Kherudero, which is about 25 kilometers from Larkana city. So I, I run the Ali Hassan Mangi Memorial Trust. And for the last 15 years, we've been working on integrated rural development. So projects in health, education and infrastructure. Um, I can tell you that when the floods hit, the way that we found out about it was I was in Karachi that day and one of our security guards who lives in a village called Ghos Baksh Umrani, he called and he was shouting on the phone and saying, you know, the water levels are rising. Our entire village is going to be inundated. And what should we do? Where should we go? And I have elderly parents, small children. You know, what should I do? So it came so out of the blue and, you know, this area was not at all affected by the 2010 floods. So it's nothing that we were at all expecting. Um, we knew that there had been, you know, rains for some days and that there was uh, an accumulation of water, but we never knew that it would be, you know, that it would become such a disaster. So instinctively, we just said, come to us, even though we had, zero level of preparedness at that time, you know, to receive flood victims. What do you mean by us? So the the staff and I at the Ali Hassan Mangi Memorial Trust, so we have about uh, 30 employees. All of them are locals from the village and the surrounding villages. Um, so everyone was on their usual duties and no one was expecting anything like this to happen. So this particular security guard, his name is Anwar, we said, well, just come to us. So he started, you know, gathering what he could and then of course other people from his village said can we come too and he said okay and then people just started pouring in so it was night um the 21st of august and uh you know people just started walking toward our community center so two three four kilometers in the rain in the heavy rain and that's how it all started can you describe the community center because i've seen it it's a compound you have a boundary wall, you have a gate, uh, and inside you have divided it in certain sections. So yes. give us a sense of how the people arrived and where they were staying. Sure. So uh, people arrived basically walking up the road from uh, villages like uh, Ghosbaksh Umrani, Ali Hassan Umrani, Gari uh, Harsa. And uh, they started walking up the road and it was he it was raining heavily. And they all just started coming in through the gate. And what we could just instantly do was our biggest space is the children's activity hall. So whoever was on duty just emptied that out and just made space to get people into some dry space. That was just our immediate. But what we didn't realize was that that same night, so many people would come from so many different places. So within the next few hours, we had 500 people um, you know, women, children at our premises. And we had a lot of families and the distress was there anyway, but we had a lot of families in extra distress because they had misplaced their children along the way. You know, in the rains and in the dark and there was no light and just in the process of gathering what they could, um, you know, children just got away from, uh, you know, their parents. So there were those mothers in distress and then they were, you know, everyone just in a state of shock. So, and of course, our team being completely unprepared for something like this was also in a shock. So, but, you know, we knew what we had to do immediately was get people shelter and then get them food and medical care. Those were the three things that we had to do. And so that's what we got about doing. This shock, and I know from my conversations with you that that night, it was really full of anxiety and um, these people turning up in droves. Uh, so I know that your team kind of managed, but can you kind of tell us what that felt like for your team and 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 all the people who you've been meeting and talking to? Because I know these mothers, they they lost their children along the way. I think Usme, you were trying to kind of manage that as well. It was really tough, Mahim. I have to say that for all of us at the trust, it was the hardest thing we have ever been through. 
and obviously working with communities like this we are going through hard things all the time but this was just a crisis of such immense proportions um and you know women were wailing children were hungry they were wet they didn't have extra clothes um you know they didn't have any kind of supplies um and the rain was coming coming down so heavily that night um you know lots of communities have told us that there were earthquakes because they their dishes were falling out of the shelves you know and even houses that were built on a higher level even those were collapsing so clearly there was something more than just rain happening there but um you know it it i think that our team on the ground was so in shock and yet you know they just had this task in mind that we have to somehow procure enough uh, material to cook for these people because it wasn't as if we could order cooked dates in the middle of a village in the middle of a storm you know all the shops were shut because of the situation so my team drenched from head to toe was going knocking on shop shopkeepers doors and begging them to open and give us rice and give us potatoes and give us oil um and then there was nothing to fuel the fire with because everything was wet the fire wood was wet the buffalo dung was wet there was no gas in the in the line so you know just getting a simple thing like cooking a cauldron of rice became like a huge production so it was hard but you know everyone i think just was so focused at that time on getting that task done that we just sort of pushed through it so it's been a couple of weeks and i think if you can talk about in the interim because i think providing rations uh you got a lot of donor funding from uh, abroad and uh, you funneled that money into the immediate sort of requirements can you talk about what the rations uh distribution system was like because i i thought that was very interesting how that unfolded so yes yeah, so a couple of weeks into the start of this entire crisis people started wanting to move back to their areas because the water levels had receded and people just generally obviously feel more comfortable closer to home so even though they had no structure anymore to live in but uh, they wanted to go closer to their land so we tried to provide tents initially and a uh, tarpaulin sheet so that people could actually move back and put some makeshift shelter up um and then yes because there was no labor work available farm land was completely destroyed so people were hungry and there was no way for them to earn a living so that our second priority um you know after the initial crisis was to provide dry rations now you know as you know um and a quick word on our funding so the funding from abroad is all individuals um you know expatriate pakistanis and others and people in pakistan providing us with funding and so yes we had to make these decisions about how to allocate funds and initially for the first 10 12 15 days it was providing cooked food which we provided to about 5000 people in different locations so not only the people in residence with us but also the people in village khero khero dero who were living in different schools government schools and people who were living in different schools in other city, uh, towns and villages and then um you know medical care was one of the other early priorities because people came in with terrible malaria you know killer malaria they came in with a host of very uh, painful skin disorders caused by uh, prolonged periods in standing water and of course children with fevers diarrhea you know that kind of thing so we had to also immediately stock up on um you know fever reducers anti malarials skin ointments and that was very difficult because none of those were available anywhere in the area so we actually had to buy small lots in karachi and have them sent over so that we could have those available so coming to the ration uh, we provided ration to about 2100 families and um you know what we as a team have always um you know uh, try to do is to provide whatever we can but with making sure that the dignity of the beneficiary is intact and so the ration distribution that always happens and that was happening at the time of the rains as well was you know a truck full of ration stopping somewhere on the road and just basically throwing the ration out to whoever could grab it now what we were doing was that we were going village by village and looking door to door at families who were actually affected by the rains and the floods 
So people who were farmers and had no way to access their crop that was now damaged. People who were daily wagers, who would take a, you know, a cart out to sell something or would do labor and that work was no longer available. People whose houses had collapsed and they were just too distraught to be able to do anything else. So direct flood effectees. So how did you uh, ascertain? Because there's a lot of poverty, I can imagine. And when you talk about distributing free sort of rations, there's yeah. a line of 600 people at your doorstep. So how do you tell who is who? Is it through Shanakti cards? And is this not really labor intensive? Like you have a limited team. How did it's you very labor intensive? But I think that at that time, you know, we thought that this was the most important task to ascertain who was actually affected by floods. Because yes, there is a lot of poverty. Everyone wants a bag of ration if they can get one, right? But the priority at that time was to find those people who really were in great distress. So their income had stopped for whatever reason, you know, so they, if they were work, if they were laborers, there was no construction happening. So there was no labor happening. If there were people who were selling something on a daily basis, couldn't sell because couldn't get out, you know, so we had to go door to door, interview families, find out what they do, look at their houses, look at what has collapsed. And then do it. it was very labor intensive, but all of us had stopped all our other projects and were only working on this. So that's, you know, we perhaps could have done more if we were not that thorough. We perhaps could have done more, but we wanted to, you know, make sure we were giving to those who really needed it at that time. Then is the issue of how we went about it. So once we had determined that this family is affected, they need food supplies, we would give them a monkey trust token. And that token would have written on it, this family, this Shanakti card, these many family members, this is what they do. And you can collect your ration from the community center. Also, Mahim, a very important aspect of this is what you put in the ration bag. Because you see, a ration bag in Karachi is very different from a ration bag in a village in Sin. Why? Because large families, the, the basic necessities are rice and flour. And you cannot give people in villages five kilograms of rice because that's only going to last them three days. Okay, so they are very large families. So we provide the minimum of 25 kilograms of rice, 20 kilos of atta, uh, you know, five kilos of cooking oil, and then a few other basic things. So, you know, we also wanted to design those packages to be suitable for the communities we served. So they would come to a gate and show the token. They would be let in and seated. When they were seated, somebody would come and verify their token with the list that we had prepared. When they were verified, they would be escorted into our former activity hall, which had been converted into a Russian distribution center. And they would go to each counter and pick up. So at one counter, they would pick up 25 kg of rice, then atta, then the other supplies. And then they would uh, be uh, escorted out through the gate onto whatever transport they had brought. So it was very important for us to make sure that you know, this was done in a way that was respectful. You were also getting a lot of people I know who from our cities, urban centers were sending uh, material in. I mean, people really did open up their hearts and wallets. Mm -hmm. At uh, Dotalwar in Karachi, there was a, a camp which was piled high for weeks with just boxes of stuff. And even during the 2010 earthquake, we heard a lot of criticism about what cities are actually sending in to the rural areas. Can you give me some examples of mistakes that should be avoided when donating and add in what going into the winter months, what kind of material do people actually really need? Like for yeah. example, tents, I think are problematic. You found they were problematic. Can you talk about why they were problematic and the tarpaulin and the boxes of biscuits and the medicine yeah. donations? Tents is a really important point because you know, this was early September. It was really hot. And giving people tents at that time, you know, it didn't make much sense because sitting inside a tent, I asked my team, I said, well, let's go sit inside a tent and see how it feels. Because even my team was saying tents, tents, we need tents. Not to mention that a tent that cost two and a half thousand was now costing twelve and a half thousand. But, you know, I said, let's put up a tent here and let's go sit in it. So we put up a tent in our park and I made everyone, including myself, go sit in that tent. And it was hot as hell, you know. So I said, this isn't, no one's going to use this. 
So I said, let's give a couple tenths and then let's follow up and see what happens with those tenths. So we gave people asking for tenths, a few tenths. Then we went back a few days later and checked what they were doing with the tents. One of them had his donkey standing under the tent. Another one had his motorcycle under the tent. And another woman had put her trunk under the tent so that, you know, it would uh, it would stay safe. So it made more sense for us to give out these plastic sheets, these turbulent sheets, so that people could put up, you know, a, a shaded space that was also open and would allow for air to pass through. I mean, people put up makeshift, uh, you know, shelter all the time, right, for themselves, for their livestock. So people were doing that. But because of the rain, that were, there was still a little bit of rain in early September, these sheets, these plastic sheets were helpful. These were helpful okay. in helping them put something up. You know? so, so they would put the charpai, uh prop it up to... So uh, before they had anything, they would prop up the charpai so that they would have some shade during the day. That's what they were doing. So those are the people who we tried to go and give these sheets to so that they could put up a space that was a little bit more spacious, you know. Um, in terms of mistakes, so we, you know, we had people coming to our door saying, we are social workers, we want to help. We see that you have a lot of uh, public here. Can we distribute something to them? So we would say, well, can you show us what it is? And they had bottled water and they had packets of biscuits. So one very important thing is quality. You know, so I wouldn't drink water from a bottle that I don't recognize the company from, right? I wouldn't do that. So, I mean, I hesitated in making people drink water from some company that I'd never heard of, especially when ground water in that area is perfectly clean, uncontaminated and bacteria free. Can so you explain it does that? Because yeah. everyone just rushed to provide bottled water, but the yeah. reality is very after a flood and the, the you know, can you explain that? So in certain areas, I'm sure that water may have been required. I can only speak from my experience. And in the areas that we worked in during the immediate crisis, those areas all have groundwater that is sweet and that we have tested, you know, at the Arahan lab several times and they are free of bacteria. And the, the water is coming from 100 feet below the ground. Okay, so these were not areas that were inundated with water or where there was a possibility of contamination. So the water was still fine. The biscuits, again, they were not from companies I'd ever heard of. You know, we I said, let's taste the biscuits first before we give them to anyone in the public. The biscuits tasted awful. You know, so I hesitate about, you know, distributing things that we ourselves wouldn't be comfortable using. Another group of people came with a sack full of medication. And they said, we've heard that you are running free medical camps all over this area. So we thought this would be useful. So I said, OK, well, let's look at it. When they took them out again, companies I had never seen or heard of, you know, and I'd be very hesitant about using those types of products that could be substandard, that could be dangerous. And so we had to politely decline. Some people might argue that, and we've seen these debates, especially when it comes to uh, hygiene kits for women, um, that uh, why are you being so picky? And people are with good intentions opening up and, and trying to help. Uh, they are sending clothes and, you know, and you can't expect someone sitting in Karachi to maybe know what to give. So what's the solution if, if, if this were to happen again? How should people, well-intentioned people, try to help? And who? why should they trust, let's say, your um, enterprise or any other. That's also greatly difficult because they do want to give money, but it becomes a bit of a uh, difficulty to kind of ascertain who is genuinely doing work. Maybe Absolutely. some people don't agree with how your, your quality control. Oh, sure. Yes. Um, very genuine concern. Um, let me address the hygiene kits just briefly. And again, you know, my whatever I say is not intended as a criticism of anyone because I cannot, you know, uh, pretend to speak for areas everywhere. I'm only speaking for communities I've worked with. I mentioned where those are. And yes, I definitely agree with you that people are very well intentioned. So they think of things that they think people need. And I think that that's a great spirit. My only um, suggestion is that whenever you 
whenever we aim to help, we should ask people what they need. Because people everywhere are the same. Everyone knows what they need. You know, and if we ask, then we will just utilize our resources and our good intention in a better and more productive way. So in terms of the hygiene kits, again, they may have been very useful in other areas. In our area, women wouldn't know what to do, for example, with underwear. Okay. And if we were to, you know, some people suggested giving them training. If we were to train them, you know, that isn't part of the culture. So that's not something they would be willing to be trained in. Um, similar things with toothbrushes. So, you know, most communities don't use toothbrushes. They use things like, uh, you know, the neem tree, uh, miswak and, and other things, you know. So I just feel like we shouldn't impose what we think is right on anyone. I just, that's just, uh, you know, and, and, and in our case, you know, because we are so grassroots, we work directly with communities. We've worked with these communities for 15 years. We understand them. They understand us, you know, and every single project that we've ever run is not to our credit. It's to the credit of the communities. The ideas come from them. So they are the ones who said to us, women in these communities are the ones who said to us, a toilet would be like heaven because it would, it would uh, you know, we wouldn't have to go out into the fields anymore. So the idea for our toilet project and prior to the floods, we had built two and a half thousand toilets came from them. So I would say in terms of mistakes, you know, I wouldn't call it so much a mistake as just a misplaced, uh, you know, good intention. But I think the key is just to ask people what they want. So just to wrap up, I'm keen to hear because the media has kind of not been discussing what's really going on in the uh, flood hit areas. And there have been a lot of complaints from people that they're not getting enough information. What is in your area of work, the sort of progress that you've made? I know you stopped the rations drive and you switched modes. What are you doing now? And going forward into the winter, uh, what do you see happening? And what are the questions people should be asking if they want to help, yeah. whether in your area or other areas? Yeah, so you know, going in, into the winter or even otherwise, the number one need in villages across Sindh is to help people rebuild their homes. So people are living out in the open everywhere. Every single village that I and my team have visited, and that's over 250 villages, are completely overturned. That is the single most important priority. We started building houses two months ago. We've built 300 so far, and we're going to keep going. So that is the single most important priority. We must build homes that are low cost, that utilize local materials and local expertise and involve the community's own efforts, but that are more sturdy than they were in the past. Um, in addition to that, for winter, we are also doing things like collecting blankets and sweaters and shoes and other winter things that we can help we can use to help the communities get through this because not everyone's going to have a home, you know, in this winter. Can you explain just as a last point, uh, how a house is built um, in rebuilt? How many rooms? How much are the bricks costing? Where does the labor come from? And when you're saying build back better, uh, what do the people want? What are they saying they like? Because, uh, did they are they choosing a different design? Is it a different material? Have they learned anything that there are their preferences now? Absolutely. They've definitely learned, and so have we. And people came to us during when we still hadn't started reconstruction. So this is early September, the early phases of the crisis, and people were saying, What are we going to do now together to make sure that we don't end up the same way if we say if we face similar circumstances again? And so we had several, you know, hundreds of discussions with people from different villages. And what we collectively concluded was that we need to have foundations that are much stronger. So the traditional construction in that area is to use um, these, you know, uh, bricks that are not whole and that are baked extra. So 
those bricks are cheaper and they are usually used in the foundation and then and that is done uh, without cement and without iron and then you build upwards with ordinary bricks using mud as the means of plaster now what we've changed this time and again this has been a, a a collaborative effort between us the communities and the local masons of that area who are also experts so what we are doing now is the foundation must have iron in it it must have cement in it and then we can build upwards using earth and then we use um iron girders bamboo sticks and bamboo sheets in the roof which is the same as before but we then also do an exterior plaster with cement so now this makes the construction really solid the cost obviously goes up but people are putting in the iron themselves they are reusing a lot of the bricks because those bricks can be reused we are then helping with the cement for the foundation the cement for the exterior plaster some bricks if they fall short and some roof roofing material if some of theirs has been damaged okay so they put in part of the material we put in part of the material we give technical guidance and site supervision so one of our guys is standing on site every house that's being built and the community puts in the labor themselves so the family actually does the labor themselves men women and children and uh, the the mason is hired by the family they pay him a daily wage to build the house how much does a house take so you know it um, prior to the floods we had a fixed number this is how much it takes because we're giving the same material to everyone it's now different because someone may need 3000 bricks and someone may need 6000 bricks so we are literally spending between 5000 and 100000 depending on what the family needs on average so far in the 300 houses we've built we've spent about 38000 rupees per house this is a two room kind of no this house. is a one room house so this is another interesting thing you know we asked people so what should we rebuild should we build a toilet and a kitchen and a room or two rooms so all people said is right now we just need one room to get our family in and that's also all we can afford to contribute toward and then later we'll see what else can be done so later maybe we'll add a toilet maybe we'll add something else um thankfully a lot of the toilets most of the toilets we built are still standing so that's been helpful and so in so you're saying you're using sarya or the the iron uh from my understanding of uh this kind of this can cause damage if it collapses that's why architects like yasmin lari or people like arif hasan who worked in the uh, earthquake zones they've been saying for a while that when you rebuild you should try to avoid this kind of material so i'm just curious um if the floods come next year uh are you confident this kind of construction will sort of be able to withstand it is it on higher ground for example so the iron is only being used in the foundation okay okay the iron is only being used in the foundation and you know we have looked at other models that a lot of people have developed in during these few months you see mahim the most important aspect is local acceptance so someone was saying that uh, there was a one of those prefabricated houses that someone put up somewhere near gadi khuda baksh and that there're going to be many more like that well you know prior to the floods i have seen a number of homes built by the benazir housing program that are unused or that are being used as store houses for grain because they are too hot because the construct the room size is inappropriate so you see the the local acceptance is really important that is why we have to stick within the framework of what is considered locally a uh, you know socially acceptable structure while trying to make it as safe as possible and prevent future damage the last thing i just want to quickly ask you before we end is you've been interacting with a lot of children and i can imagine that this these these kids this generation has this massive natural disaster there've been babies born there've been women who've been widowed i mean even for yourself i know it has been really difficult um doing this work and 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 it's been physically and mentally kind of demanding can you talk to me about how the community 
has gone through it where are they right now uh, psychologically or just how people are coping how you are coping you know um women like everywhere in these communities to are extraordinarily resilient i have nothing but the greatest of admiration for them because they have been through so much already and then they have been through this massive trauma of losing their homes losing family members losing all their belongings i have met so many women who said i couldn't even save a dish you know um and they are slowly trying to build back it's of course it's hard they are they are struggling um but they are trying to build back i find that they have so much gratitude and possibly it's that sense of gratitude that saves them from really sinking you know deeper into despair because all i constantly hear is that well thank god we still survived or thank god our children survived you know uh, so that sense of of gratitude i think is really what gets them by that's something that we should try to remember you know you asked me about the experience yes the experience has been extremely difficult um you know physically for for my entire team but also mentally just so draining and emotionally so difficult because you know we are living with those communities and seeing what they are experiencing every day talking to hundreds of them a day you know one does feel very helpless and very overcome and no matter what you try to do it just doesn't feel like enough or ne- nearly enough you know 